In this video, we will talk about syphilis. Here is a brief overview. Syphilis is caused by the spirochete called treponema pallidum. Syphilis causes a spectrum of sexually transmitted disease, and because of its very wide-ranging clinical syndromes, it has been referred to as the great imitator. Syphilis can be broken down into four different subtypes of syphilis. These include primary syphilis, secondary syphilis, tertiary syphilis, and congenital syphilis. Men aged 20 to 29 have the highest rates of primary and secondary syphilis. Some risk factors that you want to be paying attention to when you take your exam is if the test writer tells you that the patient is a male who has sex with other males, if the test writer tells you that the patient has multiple sexual partners, and if the test writer tells you that the patient has a history of HIV infection. Syphilis is synergistic and closely linked with HIV infections. Syphilis is endemic in developing countries and it's more common in lower socioeconomic areas and healthcare poor areas. Of note, the incidence of syphilis has quadrupled from 2015 to 2019 and we're seeing somewhat of a relative resurgence in the disease. The pathogen that causes syphilis is treponema pallidum. It's a spirochete, and here's what it looks like. You may or may not see this image, but be familiar that if you see this spirally looking worm, they could be alluding to the spirochete. I call it a worm. It's not actually a worm. It's a spirochete, but it looks like a worm. So here's what you should be on the lookout for. Pathophysiology, really not too much that you need to know here. The truth is, is that on your exam, when the test writer goes after syphilis, they're going to focus on the clinical symptoms and the clinical syndromes. The only thing that you need to know as far as pathophysiology concern is concerned is that the outer membrane of the spirochete lacks lipopolysaccharides and it does not have many surface exposed proteins. And so what this means is that our immune system, which relies on the recognition of proteins and lipopolysaccharides on that outer membrane in order to trigger the immune response, can't do that. So it's as if the treponema pallidum puts on a disguise and the immune system can't recognize it. The lack of proteins and the lack of lipopolysaccharides is like an invisibility cloak for the spirochete and therefore the immune system cannot mount an adequate response. Now on your exam, if you're taking USMLE or Comlex, the test writer is very likely going to test you on this by bringing up different clinical symptoms, syndromes, or buzzwords because syphilis is, it, it, it goes primary, secondary, tertiary, and it can be congenital. And in each of those different subtypes, the symptoms and the buzzwords are going to be different and there are so many images that they could show you associated with syphilis. So to make that simpler, let's go through primary, secondary, tertiary, and congenital syphilis, and I'll point out the associated findings and buzzwords that you need to be aware of. Beginning with primary syphilis, this generally occurs approximately 10 to 90 days after the sexually transmitted exposure. The big symptom here is a painless chancre. So a chancre is a fancy way of saying ulcer, and it's indurated. So if you look at these images, you see that cupping or that crater on the outer boundary of the chancre. That's induration. So it's a very key finding associated with syphilis. If you see an image that looks like this, especially if it's on a penis, chances are that they are alluding to primary syphilis. So you're going to want to pick that as your answer. Now that ulcer or that chancre tends to occur at the site of inoculation. So again, the likelihood is high that the image will be of a penis where that painless indurated ulcerated chancre is located. If the patient is immunocompromised, so if they have a history of HIV or advanced AIDS, there is a chance that multiple chancres may form because again, they're immunocompromised. So the immune system is even more weak fighting an organism that it's already weak against to begin with because again lack of proteins on that outer membrane 
So for primary syphilis, the big symptom is obviously that painless chancre. Again, it's painless. It doesn't hurt the patient. It just appears there. So what I want you to remember is that primary equals painless. Primary syphilis, painless chancre. That's really what you need to come away from this part of the video knowing. Now, secondary syphilis occurs two to eight weeks after the chancre disappears. So you get that chancre about 10 to 90 days after the exposure. That chancre eventually disappears. And then two to eight weeks later, you progress into secondary syphilis. In secondary syphilis, you can get systemic symptoms. You can get a maculopapular rash, which tends to occur on the palms and soles. And you get the formation of condyloma lata, which is a wart-like kind of white genital lesion. And you can see images of the rash. You can see images here of condyloma lata. And then you get more systemic symptoms. So what I want you to remember here is that for secondary syphilis, we start to see systemic symptoms. Primary equals painless for painless chancre. Secondary equals systemic. So when we move into the secondary phase, things are starting to spread. So you get that rash on the palms and the soles, condyloma lata in the genital area, and systemic symptoms because now the infection is spreading. Now, not included on my initial slide, but something I'll point out here is that there's actually a latent phase of syphilis. So if primary syphilis or secondary syphilis remains untreated, the patient will then move into a latent phase. And when they're in this latent phase, it can occur for up to a year, maybe more, during which time, if the patient is tested for syphilis, that serologic testing will be positive, but they will likely be asymptomatic. So this is the latent phase, named, of course, because they do have syphilis, but their testing is, their testing is positive, but they're asymptomatic. So it's latent. There's no symptoms, but they're positive for it. And this is, again, the result of untreated primary or secondary syphilis. Now, after the exposure, and we're talking months to years, the patient can progress to tertiary syphilis. And this is when things really become life-threatening. What you want to look for with tertiary syphilis are symptoms affecting the skin, the heart, and the brain. So in the heart, you get cardiovascular syphilis. So aortitis, inflammation around the aorta, and that's due to vasovasorum destruction. You can get valvulopathy, and you can get aortic aneurysms. So these are the cardiovascular manifestations of untreated and now tertiary syphilis. You can get the formation of gummas, which are essentially just granulomatous inflammations that are chronic in nature, and they tend to form around the head and in you know, the mouth, and you'll see an image in just a second. And then very serious complication of tertiary syphilis is neurosyphilis. And in neurosyphilis, the patient will experience tabes dorsalis. They'll be ataxic. They'll have a positive Romberg sign. They may experience strokes, hemiplegia, meningitis, or aphasia. And so if you're taking your exam and the test writer gives you a history of unprotected sexual intercourse, potentially a comorbid history of HIV, and then they start to describe these vague neurological symptoms, you want to start to think about perhaps this is syphilis. Lastly, a very important clinical finding that shows up on exams all the time and is probably the highest yield part of this video is the Argyll-Robertson pupil. An Argyll-Robertson pupil is a finding in the pupil where the accommodation reflex is intact, but the response of the pupils to bright light is not intact. And I'll show you what that means in just a few slides. So again, cardiovascular symptoms, gummas, neurosyphilis, and Argyll-Robertson pupils are your key findings of tertiary syphilis. So let's just kind of review these things and point out a couple images and findings you should be aware of. With aortitis, you could be shown an image similar to this. You want to know from a pathophysiological perspective that this is due to the destruction of the vasovasorum. So the inflammation caused by tertiary syphilis literally destroys the vasovasorum, therefore leading to aortic dilatation, valvulopathy, and potentially aneurysm. So aortitis, very important. The gummas, as I explained, this is granulomatous inflammation. It's chronic. It occurs on the face. 
and in the mouth slash palate area. So if you see these lesions, you should think gummas, you should think granulomas. Know from a pathophysiological perspective that it is granulomatous inflammation because this would be potentially an opportunity for the test writer to connect syphilis with immunology and then ask you questions about granuloma formation, but gummas are associated with tertiary syphilis. The Argo-Robertson pupil, so again, what's happening here is that the accommodation reflex is intact, but the pupils do not constrict when exposed to bright light. And so typically how this will work on your exam is one of two things will happen. One, they'll describe it to you in text, and that's probably the easier thing. The second is that they could show you a video, so you'll get that media clip that you open up when you're taking your exam, and they'll show you somebody being examined. This is probably more likely to occur on step two or level two. And so what they'll do is you'll see a, you know, a provider of some sort holding up a light, shining it into the patient's eyes. And what you'll note is that the pupil does not constrict. Of course, typically, we would expect that when exposed to bright light, there's constriction of the pupil. But an Argyll-Robertson pupil does not constrict. And then what will happen is they'll do a second exam where they hold some object like a pen or a pencil up and they slowly move it closer to the nose or the midline right in front of the pupils. And what will happen here is that they do constrict when focusing or accommodating on the nearby object. And so again, Argyll-Robertson pupils accommodate but don't react. They accommodate to nearby objects, but they don't react to bright light. And so what I want you to remember is that Argyll Robertson, AR, A for accommodate, R for react. And in my head, I draw like a no sign or a red X. So it's A, red X, R, which means accommodate, but not react. And that's how I've always memorized this. Lastly, let's talk about congenital syphilis. So congenital syphilis, as the name implies, results from transplacental transmission during birth. So in other words, mom has syphilis, baby is born, and there's transmission through that placental barrier, typically during birth, at which time the disease is passed on to baby. And in congenital syphilis, there are five very, very high yield associations, which can be described to you in text or shown to you in images. And they're very, very key, very unique, and you want to associate them with congenital syphilis. So the first is something called saddle nose. In saddle nose, you have destruction of the nasal cartilage, so that nose looks a bit flatter than usual. It's said to look like a saddle, hence the name. You can get something called frontal bossing, which is also known as the Olympian brow, which is sort of a protrusion of the frontal part of the skull, or just above, uh, just superior to the eyebrows. You can get saber shins, which is a way of saying tibial bowing. So there's a very slight bowing to the tibia. I'll show you a picture of this in just a second. Hutchinson teeth, very, very high yield, probably the most important of all of the things you see on this slide. Hutchinson teeth are when the central incisors on the top of the, t of the like your top set of teeth become peg shaped. It's a very unique looking. You cannot confuse that with anything else, which is why it shows up on exams pretty often. And then lastly, you can get rugades. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly. Rugades, rugades. These are linear scars that occur at the angle of the mouth. They kind of look like chelitis, but it's a bit different. Here's an image of everything I've just described. So you see the saddle nose, the destruction of that nasal cartilage. It kind of flattens out. Hutchinson teeth, again, very unique. This cannot be confused with anything else. If you see an image like this, this is syphilis. This is congenital syphilis. Frontal bossing, again, protrusion of that frontal skull area above the eyebrows. Saber shins, bowing of the anterior aspect of the tibia. And then regades, you see in that, in that corner of the mouth, in this image, it's on the right-hand corner, you see that kind of angular scar-type lesion. Lastly, let's talk about treatment. So admittedly, on your exam, it's not super important to understand treatment. I would memorize if you're studying for step one, level one, that the treatment is intramuscular penicillin G. So that's benzathine penicillin G. Don't worry about dosing or anything like that. If you're at a more advanced stage in your career, perhaps you're studying for step three or level three, then you probably want to know that for primary and secondary syphilis, you get the IM penicillin once. If it's latent syphilis, so you've progressed beyond primary and secondary, you're testing positive, but you have no symptoms. Typically, the treatment here is the same 
medication, so IM, benzathine, penicillin G, you get that once a week for three doses, so three weeks of treatment. And then if it has progressed to neurosyphilis, then the treatment's going to be intravenous penicillin G, and that's going to be 18 to 24 million units daily for 14 days, and then that's typically broken up into several doses a day. Again, don't worry about or concern yourself with the specifics here. Just know that it's IM penicillin for primary, secondary, and latent, and IV penicillin if we're in tertiary. That does it for this video. Again, Test Writer is very likely to focus on the clinical buzzwords, the pictures, the images, the Argyle Robertson pupil, the Hutchinson teeth, the things that are really unique and that can really only be associated with syphilis. Good luck.